I think you're preparing for a difficult exam, not a wedding, Anna Marie. You're too focused, said her friend, with just over a month to go until the wedding. Isn't this supposed to be a happy and carefree time? Thank goodness there are people to take care of all the difficulties. The bride smiled and shrugged. I can take care of everything myself. My wedding is the most important event for me, after all. But in reality, she wasn't worried about the upcoming celebration. She could easily entrust the organisation of her wedding to specialists. Money was not an issue. Pay and be carefree and happy until the registration. Because, as they say, if a problem can be solved with money, then it's not a problem. Anna Marie had the money, but she couldn't solve the problem that lay before her with their help. And she had no one to consult. That's the downside of wealth. It's hard to trust anyone, and it's scary to show your weakness. What if someone decides to take advantage of you for their own purposes? That's what her late father had warned her about. In his youth, he suffered more than once because of his own naivety, because of his belief in selfless friendship. Yeah, things would have been different if her parents were still alive. Anna Marie remembered her mother only vaguely. She died when the girl was only three. Her father never remarried. First, he didn't want to have a stepmother for his daughter, and secondly, he was already a wealthy man and was afraid of being taken advantage of. He had learned from bitter experience and doubted that the women who tried to impress him were truly interested in him and not just his money. There were some relationships, but it seemed they all disappointed him before it got to the wedding. So he lived as a widower, telling everyone that his only love had died and his only attachment was to his daughter. Yes, he took care of Anna Marie, but she, loving her father unconditionally, tried to live so as not to disappoint him in anything. She studied excellently, graduated from school with an honour. When her father said he wanted to send her abroad for further education, she cried for several days. Daddy, how can you do this? How will you be here without me? And how will I be without you? I don't want to part. As if there are no good universities here. In our city? That's out of the question. That means we'll have to part anyway, and in Europe, there's not only a high level of education, but also safety. Spare my old nerves. Anna Marie could never refuse her father. His words were law. And as the girl convinced herself, he was always absolutely right. However, only after successfully completing her studies abroad did she realise that she probably left in vain. She found her father ill. No, Mr. Friedberg was not in the hospital. He was, as always, cheerful, active, and even the external changes were not so noticeable. And he didn't tell his daughter anything about his disease. But the doctors used to come to them suspiciously often. Sometimes, Mr. Friedberg went to different clinics. From those fragments of conversations in which the words chemistry, radiation, and gamma knife often appeared. It was easy to understand that Anna Marie's father had cancer. Eventually, he stopped hiding the truth. Yes, daughter, it's bad, but wait, there is nothing irreparable. The best doctors are treating me. I'll last for some time yet. Isn't it better for you to go abroad now? They say in Israel. Stop it. Of course, I can go to the moon if I want, but I don't want to leave my business. You're just getting into the business, and although you're an intelligent girl, if I leave everything to you now, you won't have any support. I have to leave you in complete confidence that you will be happy and provided for. So he never went anywhere, and at home either the best doctors couldn't cope or the disease decided to take its toll and began to develop rapidly. Soon, Mr. Friedberg became much worse and it was time for long, confidential conversations between father and daughter. My poor little girl, it's not my fault that I left you completely alone, Mr. Friedberg said. You could have been married by now. I would have looked at your fiancé through a microscope. 
but now what? You'll get married anyway, but I am afraid that you won't find the right one. Don't say that, Daddy. You'll live for a long time, the daughter said, trying to hold back her tears. God save me from a life like this. If I were a dog, they would have pitied me and put me to sleep. And you say, a long time. That's how Anna Maria's father died two years ago, leaving her alone. And now she really needed his advice because she was getting married. It seemed like she was marrying a good, loving person who didn't need her money, but doubts still plagued her. She met Jeff by chance. Anna Marie would sometimes go to a small cafe near her office to distract herself from work and sit alone with a cup of coffee. Her colleagues knew about it and tried not to bother her during those moments. But one day, her solitude was interrupted by a handsome young man. At first, Anna Marie wasn't pleased about it, but it was awkward to immediately chase him away, especially since he didn't seem to be bothering her. He was just a person who also wanted to have a cup of coffee, and there were no free tables. That was all. He looked at her with interest, but what was so strange about that? She was beautiful, and there was nothing strange or suspicious about him asking her a question. It was uncomfortable to sit across from each other in silence. They were roughly the same age, and from the same social strata, and they must have had common topics. The young man took a book by a very well-known author with him that had recently been released, and he mentioned this work, which, by the way, Anna Marie didn't really like. How could two book lovers not get involved in a conversation? They jumped from one book to another, then to a third, and Anna Marie, looking at her watch, sighed. She had almost spent an hour on her break. I'm sorry, I have to get back to work. There's nothing to do. Business before pleasure, the girl said. Oh, I just came here to have a cup of coffee, and as a result, but we really had a very interesting conversation, don't you agree? I entirely agree. It's rare to meet someone who shares your tastes. Maybe we'll meet after work somehow. I'm sorry, I don't even know your name. Anna Marie. And I'm Jeff. Your name is rare and beautiful. My mother came up with it. My father wanted to call me just Anna, but my mother decided that Anna was too short and Anna Marie was just right. And it is really original. I like it. And I like it too. Your mother has good taste. Anna Marie didn't tell him that neither her mother nor father were around anymore. She really didn't have time for that this time. But there were many such conversations ahead, lively and interesting, because they decided to meet that same evening, but in a more presentable place. Anna Marie, feeling more and more drawn to Jeff, was cautious about revealing all her cards, but her caution turned out to be excessive. He wasn't looking for rich heiresses. It turned out that he himself wasn't poor. His father ran a business abroad, and Jeff himself managed one of its branches in the city. He lived with his mother, which was quite strange for a man his age, but at some point he hinted at his mother's health problems, which didn't allow her to live completely alone. The thing is, my mother's illness doesn't require treatment. It's a chronic illness that you can live with for a long time without suffering too much. But it's impossible to cure her completely. Jeff sighed and Anna Marie apologised for her curiosity. She remembered her father's illness well and understood the worries about a loved one's health. Their relationship developed rapidly. Anna Marie was only surprised that her beloved never invited her home. However, this was explained quite simply. They had lived abroad for some time, selling their apartment here. Now they didn't want to buy a new one. They dreamed of their own home, which they had already found, but it needed to be fixed up. We are currently staying in a hotel room with my mum. The room is lovely, of course, but you know, it's not very appropriate to invite your girlfriend to a hotel, Jeff explained to Anna Marie. Anna Marie agreed and was perfectly fine with his explanation. Besides, Jeff's attitude towards her was serious. 
When Jeff proposed to her one day, Anna-Marie wasn't even surprised, as if she had been waiting for it for a long time. The girl agreed, but asked that the wedding be scheduled three months later, not earlier. Jeff found this request strange, but she later explained that she needed time to prepare, and that there were too many tasks at work in the near future. By this time, Jeff already knew that his beloved lived alone in her big house. Her parents had died. After the proposal was made and the wedding date was set, nothing prevented them from living together, except for the fact that Jeff's mother was very dependent on him. After it became indisputable that their lives were forever intertwined, Jeff explained her problem to Anna Marie. You see, she is deaf and mute. Don't think it's a genetic defect. She just got seriously ill as a child, that's all. She can live with it, but it's difficult, especially when she is alone. Imagine that she can't make a phone call to ask for a service in a hotel, and she doesn't understand when someone is talking to her, Jeff sadly explained. Anna Marie was surprised and asked, and she can't understand by reading lips, and she can't speak herself, remembering some films about deaf-mute people. No, unfortunately, she had to learn from childhood, and her parents weren't rich. They were very simple people. The girl survived, thank God, and the fact that she can't hear is not so important. Besides, she has something wrong with her vocal cords. She can't speak and can't read lips. We communicate with each other using gestures. We understand each other perfectly. She's a very charming woman, I assure you. Anna Marie smiled and said, I will be happy to meet her, and we can communicate with her through a translator, that is, through you. I never doubted that you would be understanding about everything. Jeff breathed a sigh of relief and immediately made his request. I really want to live with you, but how can I leave my mother? Are you okay if she stays with us in your house for now? Anna Marie agreed. Although this request did not cause much enthusiasm, Jeff probably understood that. I understand. All young people want to live separately from their parents, but my situation is somewhat different. Besides, I think when our house is in order, I will be able to hire someone, like a caregiver, companion, in short, a woman with special education, who will live with my mother permanently. Anna Marie felt sorry for her future husband and his mother. Well, Jeff, I'm not at all upset that your mother will be with us, and I'm sure we'll get along great. And your father, won't he come here just to visit his wife? Jeff grew even darker. No, things are very complicated with my father. You see, when they got married, he probably fell so in love that her flaws weren't perceived as something terrible, and they lived quite well. And then, what's the point of babbling? He just fell out of love and didn't hide it. And my mother is not the kind of person who would live with someone who doesn't love her. That's why we left. I have purely business relations with him, and my mother has no relations with him at all. After such revelations, Anna Marie certainly couldn't refuse. She felt obliged to tell her beloved right away that she was waiting for his mother. It was time for them to meet, and the house was big, and there was enough room for her mother-in-law and future children. The next day, Jeff came with his mother. She turned out to be a very pleasant woman, beautiful, well-groomed, and looking very young. Anna Marie couldn't even say that she would take them for brother and sister, although there was no particular similarity between the mother and son, but there was nothing surprising about that. Anna Marie herself was not like her mother, repeating everything after her father. Jeff's mother was sitting at the table with a nice smile, looking slightly embarrassed and confused. She didn't understand anything Anna Marie was saying. Jeff translated, and the bride watched as their hands fluttered. The mother's hands were small, thin, and it was pleasant to watch them fluttering, although it was somewhat disappointing for Anna Marie that she didn't understand anything. I probably need to learn their language. I have to be able to communicate with my mother-in-law somehow, 
If my husband isn't home, she thought. Nevertheless, Anna Marie could not admit the advantage of her position without a certain joy. Many of her acquaintances complained about the grumpiness or scandalousness of their mother-in-laws. But she wouldn't have such a problem. That's good already. A quiet, petite woman won't get in the way of the young couple. She'll almost be invisible in the house. Anna Marie even thought about offering Mrs. Carter to stay with them forever. It will surely be pleasant for her and Jeff. He's so affectionate towards his mother, and although he says they'll eventually move her in their house, it's clear he doesn't want to. So, their life together began. At first, it didn't seem strange or burdensome. Jeff's mother really didn't bother anyone. The small, airy woman almost floated through the house, smiling sweetly at Anna Marie, or making some mysterious gestures to her son. Sometimes he translated her words to his fiancée. Sometimes he just waved them off. Apparently, Mrs. Carter said something that only related to her son and not to his future bride. But the closer the wedding approached, the more the girl began to feel uncomfortable with this silent living with her mother-in-law. Mother and son became more and more frequent in communicating in their own silent language, completely inaccessible to Anna Marie, and Jeff didn't always bother to explain what they were talking about. We're talking about our own thing, don't pay attention. He often waved off, and his mother quietly smiled, and to Anna Marie it seemed like not a sweet, but a poisonous smile now. Sometimes Anna Marie felt like Jeff's mother understood everything they were talking about. It was at least unpleasant, and at some point Anna Marie decided she should learn sign language so that she could understand what they were saying. At first she thought she could learn to communicate to improve her relationship with her mother-in-law, but now she realized that she needed this knowledge for an entirely different reason. Perhaps her future relatives aren't hiding anything. But why doesn't Jeff hurry to translate what he's saying to his mum? What does it mean that it doesn't concern her? She's not a stranger, and if they have nothing to hide, why not explain what they're talking about? It's just rude. Two people sit and communicate in an incomprehensible language to a third party, and he looks from one to the other in confusion. Anna Marie didn't want to confront Jeff directly, but she wasn't used to worrying in silence either. She knew how to solve any problems, and with this one, she was going to cope either. After going through a number of ads, she realized that learning any foreign language was much easier than sign language. There were very few teachers, but she was lucky to make an arrangement with a very nice elderly woman who was giving lessons. She lived nearby and was willing to adjust to any schedule, as she was already retired and apparently didn't have many students. Having agreed on the phone with Mrs. Kuhn, Anna Marie went to her for the first lesson the next day. To be honest, I don't know if I'll be able to learn this quite complex subject. I've seen how deaf people communicate. It seems so difficult for me. Well, they learned it and you'll learn it too. I'm sure you'll succeed, especially with me. I'm an experienced teacher. I've been working in a speech boarding school for many years. I taught so many people, both kids and adults, and everything worked out fine for everyone. And when can we start learning? Well, today if you like. Soon you'll see that it's not so difficult. Maybe you'll learn it quickly. Is the price okay with you, I hope? The teacher asked a little embarrassed, as the cost was not small. Yes, it's quite okay, Anna Marie replied. If you've read the ads, you probably know that I'm not charging more than others. Maybe I would have charged less, but I need the money, you understand, not just for myself. There are some problems that don't allow me to be cheaper, the teacher said. The first lesson was introductory, and Anna Marie liked how Mrs. Kuhn conducted it. She explained everything, obviously, reinforcing her words with gestures of her elderly but very flexible and expressive hands. It seemed like she even caught familiar movements. 
You're a wonderful student, Mrs. Kuhn praised her. I'm sure we'll succeed in everything soon. You're a great teacher. It's very interesting and informative to study with you, Anna Marie replied with a smile. They were pleased with each other, laughing, but their conversation was interrupted by the sudden appearance of a five-year-old boy. He greeted the unfamiliar guest with a smile and apologized. Mario, the teacher exclaimed, are you already up? I was in class, but it's finished now. We'll be eating soon. Stay in your room for now. Okay, the boy replied. Can I watch TV for a bit? No, not yet. After lunch. Do you want to join us? Mrs. Coon asked Anna Marie. No, thank you very much. I have to go, the woman refused. Will you come back? The little boy asked, seemingly interested in his grandmother's student. Yes, I will have the next lesson tomorrow, Anna Marie replied with a smile. She also liked the little boy. Later that evening, she looked at her future husband and his mother with a new perspective. Their movements no longer appeared meaningless to her. She still didn't understand what they were talking about, but she sensed the importance of their conversation and its need for privacy. Somehow, Jeff felt the difference in Anna Marie. He soon put his mother to bed, and alone with Anna Marie reproached her, saying, You are watching us so closely today. Don't you understand that it can be hurtful to a disabled person like my mother? Do you think I offended her? I'll apologize tomorrow. But don't you understand that it can be hurtful to me when you talk like I'm not even in the room with you? Tomorrow, I'll invite a friend over and start speaking German with her. You don't know German, do you? Won't you be hurt? Oh, you're offended? What's the big deal? We were talking about my mother's health. Am I supposed to translate her test results for you? Why not? Do you not think I'm interested in her health? Do you think I'm heartless? Okay, we won't be so inattentive to you anymore. Sorry, Jeff replied, sounding irritated. We haven't even gotten married yet, and there are already so many misunderstandings between us. Secrets, offences, Anna Marie thought to herself worriedly. She loved Jeff and dreamed of a family, children, especially after meeting little Mario. For the first time in a long time, she touched a warm, silky head, exchanging a few words with the child. She didn't even want to think about the possible breakup with her beloved but she understood that his mother could become a serious obstacle to their happiness. The mere presence of this quiet woman, who seemed so cute at first acquaintance, was now extremely unpleasant. But she couldn't tell her fiancé about it, could she? Nor could she hint that Mrs. Carter would be better off moving to her own home. Hasn't Jeff found a companion for her yet? Going to her next lesson with Mrs. Coon, Anna Marie didn't realize why she had entered the pastry shop and bought a box of pastries. On the one hand, there's nothing strange about it. She's not only going to class, but also visiting a house where a little child lives. Can you come to a house where children live empty-handed? Mm, of course not. And looking into a child's store, she bought a toy, a cheerful gnome. Nothing special, but the little boy will be pleased. Neither his grandmother nor his parents, if their home this time will be offended, I hope so, she thought to herself, noting that she had not noticed any signs of the presence of other adults in the apartment, except for Mrs. Kuhn. The elderly teacher thanked Anne-Marie for the treats. Mario was happy. He hugged the gnome to his chest, thanked her and said, Can I sleep with him, please? Of course you can. I'm sure he'll send you magical dreams, Anna Marie replied, and the boy ran to his room. Thank you, but why did you have to spend so much? Mrs. Coon asked her, slightly embarrassed. What are you talking about? It wasn't a significant expense. Besides, I heard that you have to not only pay, but also give back for education and treatment, otherwise it won't be effective, Anna Marie joked. And why did you buy a toy? Mario doesn't teach you anything. That's not true. The thing is, I love children, and I love buying toys. And since I don't have my own little ones yet, 
there's no one to buy them for. So I should be grateful to Mario for allowing me to experience this joy. And he likes you, Anna Marie. Poor little boy, he always enjoys communicating with women younger than me. It's a longing for his mother. His mother, my daughter-in-law, died in childbirth, so he never saw her. And my son, like any mother, I wanted to see my son happy. And what happened? He became a widower at a very young age. A year later, I began urging him to find a wife, but he wouldn't listen. He became very despondent and things were difficult for us. Two years ago, Patrick went to work on a long-term shift in the north and disappeared. The search yielded nothing. Since then, he has been presumed dead, but I don't believe it. Uninvited tears filled the old woman's eyes. Anna Marie touched Mrs. Coon's hand sympathetically, wanting to say something encouraging, but she stopped her. That's enough. Let's start studying. You're paying me, not for my life story. Do you understand now why I have to work at my age? They studied almost every day, and Anna Marie always brought small gifts for the teacher and her grandson, begging Mrs. Coon not to forbid or stop her from doing so. I told you it brings me joy, and besides, it seems like I'm making progress, don't you think? Yes, undoubtedly. You are a very talented student. It was truly so, whether it was Anna Marie's abilities or her quick desire to quickly learn Jeff and his mother's secret language, but it helped her to make progress. In class, they could now communicate fully with Mrs. Kuhn using sign language, and sometimes the young woman asked the teacher to simply tell her something with her hands, carefully watching her movements, trying to decipher every word. So I understand that you want to learn not so much to speak as to listen, the elderly woman guessed. Well, that's your right. And I want to tell you that not only gestures, but also the face plays a significant role in this understanding. It's expression. It's facial expressions. Some concepts can change significantly through articulation. So watch not only the hands, but also the face. After a month of such lessons, Anna Marie had indeed made significant progress in understanding sign language, but she tried not to show it at home. That is, she tried to seem as delicate as possible and didn't look at Jeff and his mother when they didn't communicate properly. She was afraid that she might miss a word, misunderstand a phrase and draw a wrong conclusion. Or, what was even worse, reveal herself. She didn't rush to give up Mrs. Coon's lessons, but the reason was different now. She didn't want to part with Mario. She was so proud that the boy was waiting for her and was happy when she visited. Would his grandmother allow her to come to them just like that, after there was no need for lessons anymore? One day, deciding that she could now understand the essence of her relatives' conversations, the young woman decided to pay attention to their next conversation. It should be noted that Anna Marie's recent delicacy had significantly dulled the vigilance of Jeff and his mother before they were convinced that she didn't understand anything. But after the girl stopped looking at them and asking for clarification during their lively dialogues, they acted completely calm, talking at any convenient moment. And so the first conversation she saw brought Anna Marie to such a shock that she could hardly contain herself. I'm so tired of playing the role of a speechless mother. Do you think it's easy for me, knowing that you're having fun in your bride's bedroom? gestured Mrs. Carter. You can't help it. A lot depends on it, and I don't neglect you either, Jeff replied. When is your wedding already, and how much do you hope to make from it? We'll have enough for a long time. We can skip our performances for a whole year. Oh, I hope I won't forget the language during that time. Anna Marie didn't even finish watching and quickly left the living room so as not to give herself away. She wasn't planning to expose the fraudsters on her own. Who knows what they're capable of if they realize that their secret is out. But how could she have fallen for this trick? Why didn't she try to find out more about her fiancé, his business, his mother and the like? 
Was it really the case that his concern for his mother had such an effect on her? They were con artists, of course, unparalleled in their field. But what was Anna Marie supposed to do now? That is, it's clear she should go to the police and report the mess she's in. Oh, what a shame it would be. But it's better to be embarrassed now than to be left with nothing after the wedding. The next day, Anna Marie went to the police station and told them about the scammers who had been in her house. The investigator was pleased, as if he had received an expensive gift. Mutes at your house? We've been looking for them for a long time. They're cunning, operate in different cities and all follow the same scheme. One of them pretends to be deaf and dumb, thus evoking pity and sympathy. They communicate in such a way that no one can understand anything. And, in fact, they are not mute or deaf at all. They'll sing like nightingales at interrogations and trials. And they are not mother and son, right? asked Anna Marie. Mother and son? Unfortunately, no. They are a criminal group. She is only 12 years older than her so-called son. They are lovers. Excuse me for saying this. But you did a fantastic job figuring them out. You even bothered to learn their language. I hope they don't know anything about it. No, I didn't tell them, answered Anna Marie with a trembling voice. Yes, she was ashamed, offended and sorry for her unfulfilled happiness. She loved Jeff so much and trusted him. How can she trust anyone now? I'll send a group right away and we'll take those scammers. They will answer for all their actions, the investigator said briskly. And don't be upset. Everything will end very well for you. There have been some very tragic cases in their biography. Anne Marie waited until her house was cleared of all these failed relatives and only then entered it. Of course, the first thing she did was cry her heart out in her bedroom. Then she called a cleaning company to spotlessly clean the house from the traces of the criminal stay. And only then did she breathe a sigh of relief. She got rid of the scoundrels and decided to thank the one who helped her avoid serious danger. She brought sweets, fruits and a toy and went to Mrs Coon to tell her the whole truth about why she had to take lessons. Both the elderly woman and Mario were happy to see Anna Marie. They sent the boy to his room to play and the women happily talked in the recently learned language. Mrs Coon congratulated Anna Marie on getting rid of a serious danger but Anna Marie was suddenly upset by the box of medicine she noticed that her teacher was apparently taking, and her appearance wasn't very healthy either. I never asked you, Mrs. Coon, but you seem to have a health problem. Oh dear, the teacher sighed sadly. I've had so much to go through in the last five years that even a stronger person would have died. My beloved daughter-in-law died, my son disappeared, and my grandson was orphaned. Where can he get support now? Sometimes I go to bed wondering if I'll wake up the next morning. I'm not afraid for myself, but for little Mario. We're all alone in the world. Who will take care of him if I... Oh, don't say that. Maybe you need some medicine, doctors. Tell me right now and I'll try to find and get it. Thank you. But why should you care about me? Well, it just so happened that you became closer to me than anyone else in the last couple of months. I'm alone too, and I have no one to take care of. I thought there would be a family, a husband and children, but this is what happened. So, don't hide anything. Tell me if you need anything. You still have a long life ahead of you. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. After a while, Mario called Anna Marie at work and crying, said that his grandmother was very ill. Anna Marie rushed to their house. Mrs Coon was still conscious, but she was so sick that she couldn't even call an ambulance. Anna Marie did it for her. While they were waiting for the paramedics, the elderly woman whispered, Don't leave Mario. Anna Marie, don't leave him. Soon they took the elderly teacher to the hospital, and Anna Marie took the frightened child with her. On the way, 
Mario kept asking if his grandmother would get better, if they would send him to the orphanage, and when would Dad come back. Don't worry, Mario, everything will be fine. I will take care of you, Anna Marie replied. But she herself was very frightened and worried, and not in vain. A few days later, they called and said that Mrs. Kuhn had died. Anna Marie had to deal with the funeral. She began to formalise her guardianship over Mario, which seemed like a very difficult task, as she was not his relative. But Anna Marie used money and connections, and finally, Mario was in her home on legal grounds. Then Anna Marie began to look for a nanny for the child, as she needed to work and could not be at home constantly. With all these worries, Anna Marie let her business slip a little. Without her watchful eye, revenues were falling, and there was no doubt that competitors wanted to take over her company. Besides, soon Anna Marie began suspecting that there was a traitor in her ranks. But who exactly? She seriously suspected her deputy, a man who had worked with her father and enjoyed unlimited trust. Was the case really against him? And it was like he knew he was close to being exposed. He tried to talk to Anna Marie himself and assure her of his loyalty in the company, but this only confirmed the owner's suspicions. No need to justify yourself, Ben. There will be a meeting of all current members of the board in a few days. We will talk about what is happening there. You understand that I cannot leave everything as it is. But the meeting didn't happen, and the deputy was not exposed. Anna Marie got into a car accident because something happened to her brakes. The young woman did not die, but she suffered a serious spinal injury, losing the ability to walk. Doctors tried to comfort her by saying that, with competent treatment and rehabilitation, she would undoubtedly recover. But Anna Marie fell into a deep depression. Now the question is how much she wants to recover, her treating doctor said, shaking his head in conversation with colleagues. Meanwhile, Anna Marie just doubted that recovery was possible. Too much had happened to her lately. A personal life crash, then Mrs. Kuhn's death, maybe the only person who sympathised and understood her. After that, again a feeling of complete loneliness, a problem at work, the inability to rely on anyone, and a complete loss of trust in everyone and everything. After all, she faced another betrayal. The accident did not happen just like that. It was arranged by her deputy, a man she had known for many years and trusted. It turned out that the investigator was finally able to restore the data from the video recorder, which was also damaged. Yes, Ben was exposed, and soon he admitted that he wanted to become the sole owner of the company and decided to kill the daughter of his late comrade, for whose funeral he had cried so sincerely. Now he will undoubtedly receive the deserved punishment, but it, will it be easier for Anna Marie herself? She suffered not only physically, but also morally. She was terrified of becoming a helpless person and she was terrified that she could easily deprive her of custody of Mario and send him to an orphanage. Anna Marie fell into a deep depression. In despair, she had already decided to give up on everything. After all, she still had some money left. She can live the rest of her life without needing anything. Moreover, she doesn't need much now. Just the salary of a nurse, a housekeeper and medicine. She has enough money for a while. What will happen next? Well, it doesn't matter anymore. She worked so hard, took care of the company's prosperity, and now, apparently, everything has come to an end. Everyone left her. Everyone abandoned her. And at the most difficult moment of the highest despair, something happened that she could not predict. Mrs. Kuhn's missing son appeared on her doorstep. Anna Marie looked at the man indifferently, masculine, what is called brutal. She asked without expression, without even sarcasm. A real son and a real father? 
Lately, she had been deceived so many times that she was not even surprised by the appearance of this stranger and his words, but he seemed surprised at her distrust. Well, yes, Mrs. Coon is my mum and Mario is my son. And yeah, I already know that mum is no longer there, but Mario, where is he? Neighbours said you adopted him or took him under your care. I didn't quite understand. Under custody, he is here with the nanny. You can see what I look like after the accident, Anna Marie said, tapping the armrest of the chair and yelling into the house. Helen, please bring Mario here. Don't worry, I have documents. Everything is in order, the man said, as he placed a stack of papers on the table in front of her. But Anna Marie didn't even glance at them. Why do I need your documents? I already know perfectly well how these documents are made. What do you want from me? To take Mario or get money? At that moment, the nanny entered with Mario. They greeted each other and the boys stared in surprise at the stranger he didn't know. It was difficult for him to recognize his father, whom he hadn't seen in over two years, and whom he had last said goodbye to when he was only three. Don't you recognize him, Mario? Anna Marie asked. Mario, the man said, suddenly turning pale and reaching out to him. The boy seemed to recognize or hope for something in his eyes, but he couldn't believe it yet. So he went to Anna Marie and took her hand. Anna Marie, has he come for me? He asked a little scared. It seems so, little one. The man says he's your dad. Mario, do you not remember me at all? How we swung on the swings? How we went to the bird exhibition? You were scared of the parrot. It was so big and colorful. He shouted loudly. The boy replied uncertainly. Exactly, the man said. What word did it say? Do you remember? He said hello, the little one said uncertainly, squeezing Anna Marie's hand harder. Apparently he was still afraid of this man and didn't want to be taken away. Do I have to go with you or what? I want to stay here with Anna Marie. I love her, he said, his voice trembling. Come on, don't be afraid. And you, Anna Marie, don't be afraid either. I'm not going to take anyone away. I just want to know that you're here, that everything is okay, and visit you until Mario will get used to me, and then maybe we'll become friends. Well, as you can see, everything is good with us. Anna Marie clapped her armrest again. I honestly started to worry that you would want to take the boy away, because he's the last link that ties me to life. Mario, go and play with Tanya for now. I need to talk to your dad. When the boy left, she turned to the man again. Okay, you don't need the boy. But what do you need then? Money? Money? And why wouldn't I need my son? I just said that I am not going to take him right away now. But I really ask for your permission to communicate with him. And what does money have to do with it? I don't understand. You don't believe me, apparently. I don't believe anyone. Over the last few years, I've been deceived so many times, and it was all for money. And you, let's say you're Mrs. Coon's son and Mario's father, and let's say you don't need money, but some kind of communication with your son. But you haven't been here for almost three years. That's a very long time, you have to admit. I understand that there could be many reasons, but still, you left your sick mother and your little child, and didn't even provide any information about yourself. I'm not even talking about helping them financially. That's why I not only don't believe you, but I don't understand you either, as you wish. Yes, it's hard to believe. I wouldn't have believed it myself. I can explain the reason for my long absence, but the story is completely unbelievable. It will be much harder to believe me than to believe that I am just a scoundrel who ran away, wandered somewhere, and now returned. And you probably think exactly that. I don't think anything at all. What do I care? Whether you wandered or were kidnapped by aliens, it doesn't matter to me. I understand that it's better for Mario to be with his biological father, especially a healthy person, than with me. I'm practically a wreck. I probably will never be able to stand up, no matter what the doctors say. And what kind of guardian can I be? 
I'll live on the remaining money and then what? A meagre pension and guardianship money. So of course come to us. Let Mario get used to you and over time you'll be able to take him away. Where do you live? In Mrs. Kuhn's apartment? Yes, I am her direct heir. The environment there is familiar to Mario. Of course, it's more comfortable here, but that's okay. You said the doctors promised you recovery, didn't you? Well, what do they promise? They understand that I have money, so why not try to treat me? I'll agree to treatment only if recovery is possible. Otherwise, why bother? They'll start spinning me around, operating, then restoring, then operating again, and torturing me with exercises. I don't know what else, and it could take years and the rest of my money, but will it be worth it? Who knows? Why wouldn't it be worth it? People recover even after the worst accidents. Maybe not completely, but still. Thank you. You comforted me, of course, but you see, I'm unable to fight any more. If you knew what I had to go through in the last year. Oh, let me tell you what happened to me. Maybe this will redeem me in your eyes and give you a couple of thoughts. Well, if you have time, tell me. Wait, I'll call the assistant. She'll get something, at least tea. Or maybe you want something to eat? Well, not really. There may be some tea and snacks. You'll tire yourself of my story and, of course, won't believe anything. There won't be any aliens there, the man smiled. The assistant came in, set the table, helped Anna-Marie and left. So my mother probably told you that my name is Patrick and I went to work in the North on a rotational basis. And in fact, everything would have been fine there and I would have earned money. Nothing would have happened to me like with other people. But one day I decided to take pictures of wild nature. What a fool I was. I just stepped away from the path. I thought that it was no big deal. I would come back to our camp because the road was generally known, but I was wrong. I came out into an open space and then the blizzard started. What kind of blizzard it was. I've never seen such a thing before. Just snow around and nothing else. I walked, shouted, and apparently moved further and further away from our camp. I should have just stayed in one place. However, I decided that I needed to move to avoid freezing. Then the bear came out of nowhere, and we literally ran nose to nose. I couldn't see a thing. I had no gun, nothing. But I guess he wasn't interested in messing with a human. He just shoved me out of the way a little bit, but that was enough for me. Anyway, a few hours later, or who knows how much time later, the huntsman who was hunting the bear found me. He found me frostbitten and unconscious. He brought me back to his hut. He didn't know where I came from, but he couldn't just leave me there. He began to treat me. But didn't he call the doctors? He must have had some sort of connection to the world. He's not just a hermit, is he? Anna Marie was gripped by the story, but couldn't help making the remark. Of course he would have, but the connection was broken and there was no way to fix it. And there's no way to call a doctor or anyone else. And even if he could get in touch for a while, the rescue team wouldn't come anyway. Yes, because there's no way to get to him. But he was an experienced man and knew how to give first aid for all accidents, frostbite injuries and all that. I came to my senses, but I didn't remember anything. I didn't even remember my name or surname. I didn't know how I ended up in the woods or my city address. So the huntsman didn't worry much about it. He knew that someday I'd come back to my memory. While I was recovering, the summer passed and then I came to my senses, remembered who I was, where I came from, and explained where I worked. And the huntsman said, there's no camp there. They've taken off and left. I was shocked. The gamekeeper said to me to wait for the rescue team to come and take you away. But how long to wait? I asked. As long as it takes, was his answer. He was a gloomy man, not at all inclined to heart-to-heart -to -heart talks. But I wasn't inclined to sit and wait either. 
It was spring, the snow was gone. I said, I'll go myself. Just tell me which way to go. I'll find my people, or at least some civilization. I need to go home. My mum and son are there. Go wherever you want, it's a forest. There are no signposts, he said. And you're not going anywhere. You'll run into some animal again. And I don't know if I'll find you. Because I'm not here to look for crazy vagrants. And the winter is coming. So the winter passed, and it was only in the summer that he agreed to help me to return to civilization. As you can see, it took a long time to get here without money or documents. I had to, but I was late. Of course, it's a pity for my mum. Anna Marie sighed and began to tell how she had met Mrs. Kuhn, how this kind elderly teacher had helped her. Mario still doesn't know that his grandmother is gone. I don't know how to tell him about it, although probably it's wrong. After all, my mum also died when I was three, and I was not told anything for a long time, and I was waiting for her. I remember that. They say children forget things quickly, but it's really not that simple. And especially loved and dear people are never forgotten. Well, some people are worth forgetting, and the sooner the better, as well as all sorts of unpleasantness. I hope Mario remembers me. He's already starting to remember some things, and of course I won't take him away from you yet, but I'd like to visit him as often as I can, if that's all right. Of course. You need to get used to each other, your father and son, while I am just a stranger, and disabled as well. If I were healthy, maybe... Have you decided to surrender to this illness? You're not going to get treatment, right? I've already told you. That's it. That's a pretty stupid wrong opinion. Sorry, think about it. What would I have achieved if I had decided to lie quietly and die somewhere deep in the North Forest, in some hut without the slightest amenities and no signs of civilization at all? That huntsman would have nursed me back to health against my will. He said that if I didn't want to work on myself, I could die, and that he wasn't my sister in mercy. I, a city man, didn't immediately join this struggle. I was waiting for people to take care of me, to pity me. And when I realized that no one was going to, I had to do it myself. And I succeeded. The huntsman later admitted that he didn't think I'd get up. And don't think that I'm trying to persuade you or anything, but you will make not only yourself miserable, but you won't be able to help Mario either. I see how attached my son is to you. That's why I don't want to rush to take him away from you. Do you want Mario to carry pots for you when he grows up? Especially if there's no money left for hiring caregiver. I'll go to the home for the disabled, said Anna Marie. That's an excellent solution, especially for a young and beautiful woman. I don't dream of anything like that. Barely holding back her tears, Anna Marie shouted, I want to live, but please understand me. It's very scary. The operation on the spine. After it, I can become a complete disabled. There is a chance that I won't even be able to sit in a wheelchair. I'll be a log. Do you think that's better? I don't think so, but it's no good sitting here either. You have money, so you might find a good doctor to help you. Anna Marie wanted to shout at him, as she usually did, but it was easy for him to say that she had been through so much and could not risk the little she had left. But she looked at the scars left on her arms by frost, or perhaps by the bear's claws, and bitterly she cried. I'm sorry, but it's very hard for me. I'm alone. I've lost faith in everyone. I've lost faith in anyone. I just don't have the strength. How do I know which doctor is good and which is not? How do I know if I'm going to make it through rehab or not? I mean, who will come to my hospital? What's going to happen to Mario? I think everyone will be happy to see me die. Well, that's it. Stop crying and being afraid. I understand you well, as far as a man can understand a woman. Yes, it's harder for you, but you need to live. 
and I want you to live your life to the fullest. I'll try to find out everything tomorrow about your injury, the operation, the degree of risk and everything else, and then I'll tell you everything. And then you can decide what you want to do. Meanwhile, if you don't mind, I'll have a little chat with Mario before I go. Anna Marie only nodded. She was very puzzled by Patrick's words. Left alone, she seriously considered his words. Was she right to refuse to even try to regain the ability to walk? Yes, the operation will not be easy, and the doctors do not hide it. But by refusing it, she's making her life even more difficult. And not just her own, by the way. She's a burden to everyone, including the woman she hired as a nurse. Even Anna Marie herself began to notice how her character was deteriorating. Once a young and determined woman, she was gradually becoming a capricious, whiny, demanding and harmful woman. The nurse taking care of her seemed to be enduring her behaviour out of pity, but how long could that last? Anna Marie closed her eyes in shame, remembering how she sometimes behaved. When Patrick stopped by to say goodbye, she asked, If it's not too much trouble, could you find out about the surgery? It can't continue like this. The man simply raised his thumb in silence, joy and approval sparkling in his eyes. Preparations for the surgery began that day. Anna Maria's behaviour and attitude changed completely, even though her condition remained the same. She no longer demanded extra attention, trying to deal with certain problems on her own. She even spoke to the doctor Patrick had found for her and looked confidently toward the future. The operation was successful, but that didn't mean Anna Marie could immediately stand on her own two feet. At first it seemed like her problems had only gotten worse, but Patrick and Mario didn't let her fall into despair. They visited her every day in the hospital, supporting her and rejoicing in every small success. And finally, the day came when she stood up with Patrick's help for the first time since the accident. It was only the beginning of her recovery, but Anna Marie was confident that she would soon not only be able to walk independently, but also fully return to her old life. The business kept worrying her, but not just in terms of money, she realised that she couldn't abandon her father's business. While still in the hospital, she began actively communicating with those who now ran the business, at first only over the phone, but then she began calling them to visit her in the hospital and met with them at the table in a business suit after her discharge. Everyone understood Anna Marie was returning. We've lost a lot due to the machinations of my former deputy and my illness, but I am certain that working together will help us regain and increase everything, she said at a general meeting when she came to the office for the first time using her cane. The employees greeted her words with applause. Along with the recovery of her business skills, her personal relationship with Patrick developed. She realised the role he played in her recovery. You literally saved me. If it weren't for your words, I would still be in a wheelchair making demands of everyone, she said to him once. That's because I fell in love with you, Anna Marie. Yes, at first sight, with a sick and unhappy person. I believed that you would stand up and walk with me in a white dress. Will you agree to be my wife? asked Patrick. His confession was somewhat unexpected, but welcome. Anna Marie also felt that she had finally met someone who would never deceive her and that she loved this person, perhaps for the first time. Of course I agree, she replied, but only after I can walk without my cane. However, she didn't have to wait long. Very soon, the beaming groom and bride performed their main dance at a solemn ceremony.